one week and this is all I've got to show for it. This is gonna be a long build. Greetings fellow nerds! Welcome to my week one vlog from my Sharzaku through time build. This series was inspired by looking at an old video by model making guru and seeing just how much his process has changed in the last five years. Since I am a beginner, I wanted to document my current building style and processes so I can see how it evolves over time. Also due to this being a process and build vlog, there will be some tutorial like bits where I explain my process and some time lapses of the build. The episodes may not be perfectly balanced because I am also tracking the relative speed of my builds. I am also in that lane right now where my primary focus is just making each build better than the last, so I am a bit slow. Now with all of that out of the way, let's get started. I begin each build with a concept and various checklists. This build's concept again is Sharzaku through time. This diorama will take three model kits. Two of the Zaku 2 2.0s and one black Tristar's high mobility Zaku 2. The idea is to have one suit either in the process of being built or fresh off the line, then that same suit a little more customized but also slightly more damaged representing a little ways out in the future. The third suit will have the high mobility thrusters as well as a lighter payload representing the need to go faster. I will also be using a couple of resin kits. This will be a first for me. However, I do see a lot of questions on Reddit and Facebook asking how to use resin conversion kits, so I figured I would film my build and the challenges it brings along with how I overcome those challenges and hope to help any who attempt this in the future. Due to someone breaking my window, I am not able to use the lacquers I was originally planning, so I went and got a new paint brand I had not used before, Mission Models. This is a water-based acrylic paint system that is supposed to be super durable according to their webpage. I will review the paint at the end of the series. I wasn't able to get all of the colors, still missing brass, nor was I able to get all of the supplies needed or the bases, but hopefully I can obtain those as time goes by. I also have a to-do list for the order of the build, just so that I can keep track myself. I will start snap fitting the first Aku 2, then paint the inner frame, then the armor, and finally setting the initial post before moving on to the second Aku 2. Then I will continue down the list in order until the whole thing is complete. With a plan in place, it is time to start building. Once I get the box open, I open all the sprue packs and check each of the sprues for damage or missing parts. I don't want to get halfway through the build and find out something is missing. Next, I use the instruction manual to sort the sprues. I have specialized shelves to hold the sprues, but they tend to be filled with sanding stick packages and other items. Luckily, a great organizer comes with the model kit I built. I start by standing each sprue in the box in alphabetical order. A is always the easiest to find because it is multicolored. Once sorted, it is easy to find any sprue I need. I simply flip to the letter I need, snip the piece needed, and then replace the sprue so it all stays in order. I found that organization is critical to success, especially with these master grade kits. Starting with the basics, the first thing I do is remove the pieces off the runners. I have a few different nippers that I use to do so. These blue handle nippers are Godhand SPN 120s. If you've been building Gunpla for a while, you will have heard of these as they are considered the gold standard. The next pair is new. These are single blade nippers from the USA Gundam store. They are supposed to be similar to Godhand, so I'll be testing them here to see how flush I can get on the plastic. The third set are Tamiya sharp pointed side cutters. They are more durable than the Godhands, so I always start with them. I start by cutting at the end of the gate so I have the end of the runner. I do this to avoid potential stress marks. Since I will be painting this kit, it doesn't matter so much, but I like to keep solid fundamentals. Before I cut the nubs off, I check whether a piece is coupled, which means it has a connecting piece with nubs in the same spot, or decoupled, nubs I do not touch. This piece, while the nubs are directly across from one another, has a valley between the nubs, so I will treat it as decoupled. When I cut the nubs off, I go from the back of the piece. This allows me to see the edge of the plastic, and I can cut more precisely. Doing so prevents mistakes like gouging the plastic of the actual piece. Since I am using the god hand nippers, I can get really flush with the plastic, leaving only a tiny nub. Any other nippers, I would cut further away. The next step for me in nub removal is sanding. I don't use an X-Acto blade, so I go straight to the sanding. I have a couple different tools that I use for this, depending on the surface that needs sanding. 
Due to most of the surfaces being flat on this piece, I will be using Madworks adhesive sandpaper. The sandpaper attaches to an acrylic grinding plate also made by Madworks. Having the non-flexible plate allows me to keep the flat surfaces flat and the edges sharp. I want to avoid rounding off edges as much as possible. I also have a couple sets of sanding sticks that can do the same, although they are slightly more flexible due to the softer inner core. Another tool I use are these customizable sanding sheets. They have a plastic backing and can be cut into any shape in order to reach those difficult to sand places. I had these shipped from overseas from emodels.co.uk. For the round surfaces, I use these sanding sponges from Madworks. They are perfect for any surface with a curve. However, it is not good to use these on a flat surface as there is a risk of rounding off the edges. If I really need to get into a small area or simply want to feel while I'm sanding with my fingers, I will use these Tamiya finishing abrasives. Time to clear the bench and start sanding. Whether or not I'm painting determines the grits I use. Since I am painting this kit, I will primarily be using 600 grit sandpaper. 600 grit is coarse enough to remove the minimal nubs, yet fine enough that the scratches caused by the sandpaper will be filled by the primer. I start by just moving in one direction. I want to ensure that everything is sanded equally. After sanding for a bit, I use my thumbnail to see if any nub is left. If so, I continue sanding. Once the nub is mostly gone, I will use a slight back and forth motion, and then to even out the sanding marks, I will do some quick little circles. Sanding is one of the parts of model building I've heard many people are not a fan of. I find it therapeutic as it is difficult to stress about that meeting or presentation tomorrow when all of my focus is on ensuring that I am sanding correctly. Mindfulness, simply being present in the moment, is what sanding gives me. I want to show how I would sand if I were not painting. Starting here, after sanding it smooth with the 600, I would then progress through the grits. I am going to use sanding sponges here for demonstration purposes since I have not purchased tools needed to sand higher grits on flat surfaces. I give a good sanding with 800 grit, followed by another good sanding with 1000 grit. Once that is complete, I sand with 1500 grit and then finish off with a finishing stick. That brings the piece back to shiny and smooth like the original plastic. Sometimes this will leave an injection mark which is slightly darker than the surrounding plastic. It was explained to me like this. When the plastic is injected, it is forced through the entire mold. The tiny spaces where the nub meets the piece have the most built up pressure. The plastic may end up more dense or compact here as it cools. This is most visible in reds, blues, and dark gray. Sometimes white will also have gray spots. So I will continue sanding until I come across something else I can chill. I didn't get too far before I made a mistake. One thing I have learned is that if it isn't fitting, then I'm doing something wrong. It's not the kit. Bandai engineering is pretty spot on. I was trying to force a piece in and I wasn't paying close enough attention to the instruction or the orientation of the piece, so it didn't fit. Moving on, I quickly run into a curved piece that needs sanding. For this, I use the sanding sponges as I do not want to flatten the curve in any way. Since the sponges are softer, I tend to start with the 400 grit rather than the 600. All I do is place the sandpaper on the piece and then rock the piece back and forth, letting the sandpaper roll with the curve. Once the nub is gone, I will then use the 600 grit to smooth it out a little bit. And there is no nub left. Finally, I will sometimes misuse the 1000 grit sandpaper just to make it a little easier to see if anything got flattened in the process. As I am sanding each piece, I keep an eye out for these mold lines. They are created when two mold pieces of the mold aren't completely flush. It causes this tiny line down the middle of the plastic. If I were working on a larger piece, I would use this Citadel mold line removal tool, but I haven't quite mastered it yet enough to use it on a piece this small. My hope is to one day get into modeling competitions, and this is one of the things the judges look for, so even though this one may not be all that visible on the model, I still want to clean it up. I stand against the mold line until I no longer see the shadow. The shadow represents a small lip showing the mold line is still present. This is a long process, so I will speed it up. It is a lot of work, but it is all cleaned up. When building a new model, my process has been to snap fit the kit together first in order to see seam lines, difficult to paint parts, as well as what is truly not going to be visible. The beautiful thing about Bandai Engineering is the kits snap together and hold very tightly. That is not necessarily something I want. For instance, I am fairly certain on this model I will have this cockpit exposed so that the inside is visible. That would be difficult to paint while inside the chest cavity. 
So what I do is locate the pegs and make sure none of them are going to still be visible. I do not want to cut the pegs like the ones on the shoulder joints where the ends show all the way through. That being said, I do like pegs that show all the way through as I can paint the tip in one color and the receptor in another and it creates a nice effect without a ton of effort. The next step is to think about how I would naturally attempt to take the pieces apart once assembled. It can be weeks between snap fitting the kit and then taking it back apart to paint, so most likely I will have forgotten how I cut the pegs. On the top there is not much to grasp, however on the bottom there is a lip I can use to grip, so I would most likely pull from there. For each of the pegs, I cut the ends off at a 45 degree angle. I make sure that the shorter end is facing the direction that I will be pulling from. This allows that side to move easier, making it simple to get started. Once all the pegs are cut, I can then snap the pieces together snug to check for seam lines and other oddities. Then when it comes time to paint, I can pull it apart. It still remains pretty snug at the end bit, so a little wiggling is still necessary to get the pieces completely decoupled. However, this is much easier than if the pegs were not cut. The last thing I need for snap fitting the kit is removing the nubs from coupled pieces. These two pieces have mirrored nubs, so right across from each other when put together. I cut those nubs off together to ensure an even surface. This one I do not need to cut the pegs because there is only a poly cap on the inside and I do not want to paint that. I trim part of the tops off in order to avoid stress marks. If left uncut, the nubs would push against each other, causing stress marks on the piece. Once trimmed, I push the pieces together and the nubs don't press against each other. Perfect! Now I can trim both of the nubs together. Just line up my nippers and cut. This ensures that the surface is even. I clip all of the group nubs and then sand the pieces together as well. Again, the point is to keep the joined surface even. I do the same with round parts, like two halves of a bazooka. I push them together, cut both nubs, and then sand as one giant hole. Day one is done and this is the progress I was able to make. These beads are the worst. Sanding them wasn't too bad, but getting them off the plastic was extremely painful. The plastic between each bead expanded, which means I needed to rip them across. That caused a bit of a blister on my finger. I also had to take off the gloves so that I could grip better. That wraps up week one. See you after the Sazabi group build for week two. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and until next time, nerd life, yo. Yeah!